Hey, Tyson here from Refuge Church in Lenore City, Tennessee. Thank you for listening to our message today. Refuge Church is a family of faith sent to proclaim hope in Jesus Christ through relationships. For more resources and information about Refuge, please visit us on the web at refugeph.com. In this song, I couldn't help but think about today's message as we look at James chapter 4. James is going to use the word adultery or adulteress or basically not being faithful to God. And, and this, this song, it talks about, with my life laid down, I surrendered now, I give you everything. You know, probably most of us would say that that's probably not always a picture of our life, that we would love for our life to be that through our whole life. But sometimes it's not. Sometimes we chase after the things after the world. But then after this, in that song, it says, uh, God is faithful, right? And what we're going to learn today in James chapter 4 is that even when we're not faithful, God is faithful. That's what we're going to look at in James chapter 4. If you're a visitor with us, uh, you can text the word VISIT to 276-8686 to get a copy of our sermon notes. You can follow along with us. We're going to be in several places today. Um, <clears throat> some teenagers are going to find out some things that are in the Bible that they didn't know were in there today, uh, which will be interesting. May make them want to read it. We'll see. Uh, but I, I would title this message today as, Whose Team Are You On? Um, when you start thinking about this passage and this idea of us being faithful to God or unfaithful to God that James is going to talk about today, he's really going to hit us in the mouth. Uh, I couldn't help but think of, of somebody like Benedict Arnold. When somebody's a traitor or somebody betrays their country or betrays anybody, that's the go-to saying is you're a Benedict Arnold. Like his name is synonymous with people who are unfaithful, who have betrayed their country. You know, we've had people who have <coughs> given away our nuclear secrets to Russia. We've had people who've told people where our nuclear submarines are. I mean, we've had people who, for money, have betrayed the United States. They've, they've given secrets away, stealth technology, all these things. And, and uh, we look at this idea of being faithful. We, we see people who have sold out their loyalty to the United States or to their country or their fellow countrymen for, in a lot of cases, it's for money. They, they've chosen money over being faithful or loyal to their country. And, and you got to ask the question, whose team are you on, right? Well, James in this passage is going gonna, is gonna to address this. Uh, uh, imagine, imagine you play on a sports team. Imagine you spent all week practicing with, with these guys and these players, and you're going through your plays, and you're going through all these things, and then it's game time, and they begin to announce the team, and all of a sudden somebody that's been practicing with you all week runs out in somebody else's jersey. The very person you're going against it would be an act of betrayal, right? How, how dare you come to our practice, take all of our stuff, and take it to the other team and tell them what's going on. It's an act of betrayal. And I, I want you to keep this in mind, this idea of betrayal as we look at this passage. This idea that James is going to address us being adulterous, and, and he's not really talking about a marriage relationship there. He's talking about our relationship with God. That sometimes we're not loyal to God, we've put our loyalty in the world instead of to God. James uses this, this description of adultery being unfaithful. What, what does unfaithful mean? Well, unfaithful would be without faith, faithless. We're, we don't have faith in God. We've, we, we're the opposite of that. We're not committed. We're not loyal. So as we look at this passage, I want to I wanna bring us into context. So let me read uh, starting in verse 1, our real passage is starting in verse 4 through about 6. So let me read this. <clears throat> in verse 1 it says, What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and you do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You do not ask, or you do ask, and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. So let me stop there. We, we don't ask God because we don't trust God or we want to trust in ourselves. Or when we do even pray or ask God, we ask wrongly because we want, we want his things. It says we ask wrongly so we can spend it on our passions. We ask wrongly because we want God's things and not God. Go back to my example last week of the prodigal son. Right, the prodigal son did not 
desire a relationship with his father, what he desired was his father's things. I want the stuff that you can give me, Dad. I really don't care about my relationship with you. Imagine the betrayal that the father felt in the, in the story of the prodigal son. Now, now, with that in mind, with the idea of Benedict Arnold, with the idea of somebody practicing all week with your team and coming out and playing for the other team, let's read verse 4. It says, You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the Scripture says he yearns jealous, jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell within us. But he gives more grace. Therefore it said, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So as we look at this passage, here's a couple of things that I want us to think about. With the idea of betrayal in mind, with the idea of, of <coughs> unfaithfulness, he starts off with this word, adulterous. You adulterous people. He's talking to Christians. James is writing this letter to Christians. And he says, your loyalty is divided. Those first four verses, is he says, you're more focused on yourself, your passions. You want things for you. You even pray to God for things so that you can use it for you. And then he says here in verse 4 that you're an adulterous people. Why? Because you have friendship with the world. Well, what does that look like? Friendship is like a fondness. It's wanting to be close to. It's being loyal to. So now you have this divided loyalty as a Christian. Are you going to go with the world, or are you going to go with God? Now, let's be honest. In today's culture, it's very clear. There's a very clear dividing line of what it means to follow God versus what it means to follow the world. Is it not clear that in the world today, especially in America, that we are not following the commands of God? You just look at how our world is going. You look at the direction that it is going in, and it is the opposite direction of God. Matter of fact, I would say... On purpose, we're going in the opposite direction of God. Anything that has anything to do with God, people push back against. So, so in our world today, this friendship with the world is, is really choosing to say, okay, in this instance, the world says this is good for me, but God says this, I'm going to choose to go with what the world says. And Christians, we as Christians fall into this trap of, of doing what the world says and not what God says. So, so this is the idea, this divided loyalty. As, as, as friends, we, we think about friendship, we try to impress our friends. We want our friends to like us. And to be friends with the world, guess what? Sometimes we want the world to like us. There's nothing wrong with wanting to be liked. But when we compromise our beliefs just to be liked, this is exactly what James is talking about in this passage. That, that sometimes we put aside following the things that God has told us to do just so that we can be liked by the world or not hated by the world. And I'll be honest with you, there, the, I've told you this multiple times. The, the world, especially in America, they're coming after the church. They're going to come after the church soon. They're going to take things away like Facebook Live. They're going to take, away, take us away on YouTube. They're going to take us away on social media and consider us to be hate speech. It's coming, and it's coming faster than you think it is. And the church is going to have to decide in that moment, who are we going to be? Are we going to compromise just so we can be a part of the world, or are we going to be faithful to what God has called us to be? In this passage, he says, you adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Enmity is hostility to be in opposition to. And James is asking this question right here, whose team are you on? When it comes down to it, whose team are you on? You're going to have to make a choice. Do you want to be like the world? Or do you want to be obedient to, the God, to God? And those two are not always the same. We go back to that idea of the prodigal. Do we want the world? Do we want the things this world has to offer? Or do we want God? That's the question. Now, this idea of being hostile to God, we, don't, we as Christians don't view it that way, right? When we, when we play in the world a little bit and we let the world influence some of us, 
We don't, we don't look at that as being enmity with God. We, this word adultery or adulterous or uh, adulterous people that James has called us, we really don't see it this way. But what I want to show you today from God's perspective, how this is so true. And I, and I think through this, what we're also going to see is the grace of God, which is amazing. Okay? If we think about it this way, this word adultery, it seems harsh, but let's just use the example of my wife. What if I had a divided loyalty to my wife? What if I said, you know, I'm loyal to my wife 95% of the time? You would say, well, you need to be shot, probably. She would have probably already shot me. But, but being 95% loyal, is that loyal at all? It's really not. If I was not loyal to my wife, would there be enmity? Would, would there be hostility? You can guarantee that. Right? And, and, and see, this is the idea. We look at this word and we think, man, it, this is harsh. But, 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 but this leads us to this next passage. We're, we're going to look at this characteristics of, of God and we're going to say, man, that... It doesn't sound like a very godly trait, this word jealous, because we're going to see this in this next passage, that God is jealous. But I want to show you something here. Verse 4 is a major warning to us about where our loyalty is. Whose team are we on? Now let's get to verse 5. Verse 5 says, Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that Scripture says he yearns jealously over the Spirit that he has made to dwell in us. Now, this is one of the hardest verses in all the Bible to translate. If you look, read this passage in the New Living Translation, it'll look a little different. Uh, it could go either way. I believe, based on context, the ESV has it correctly, <coughs> that it's the, the Holy Spirit that God has put in us that he is jealous for. God yearns for the Holy Spirit that he's put into us. He yearns for it. He is jealous for us. Uh, I don't know if you know this. If you're not a Christian, you may not understand this, but when we become Christians, we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. He puts his Holy Spirit inside of us. Now, you may think, well, that seems kind of weird, but here's how that works for us. I'll give you an example in my life. When I got saved as a Christian at 17, my mouth was my biggest problem. Well, it wasn't my biggest problem. It was my most obvious problem. How's that? I had bigger problems than that in my life. But my mouth was my problem. I thought saying cuss words made me look cool. So when I became a Christian, all of a sudden my mouth had to clean itself up. And here's how the Holy Spirit worked in my life. is right before I wanted to say a cuss word, it's like God stopped time for a moment and said, do you really want to say that? Some people would call that their conscience, but as a Christian, it's more than that. Because before I was a Christian, I didn't have a conscience like that. I had a conscience about other things, but I didn't have a conscience about the things of God. So, so that's the Holy Spirit speaking to us. That's what it means to have the Holy Spirit inside of us is, is when we are about to sin, the, the Holy Spirit says, are you sure you want to do that? And then after we sin, God, it, it's this conviction of the Holy Spirit that says, you know, you're really not being Christ-like in that. This, that's what it means to be indwelt with the Holy Spirit, that God puts his Spirit inside of us. And, and, and this spirit inside of us, God says he yearns jealously for those who have the spirit of God inside of them. And then it says that God is jealous. Now, when we think about that, we think, well, that doesn't seem like a very godly trait, does it, for God to be jealous? I mean, at the end of the day, what does God have to be jealous of? He's, he's all-knowing, he's all-loving, he's self-sufficient, he's um, all-powerful, he, he doesn't need us. But, but I want you to show you this. In, in, in Scripture, there's multiple places where it says God is jealous. Exodus 20, verse 5, it says, I, the Lord, am a jealous God. Exodus 34, 14, For you shall worship no other God, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. Deuteronomy 4, 24, For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. Jealousy is defined as against all other rivals. Right, that's what it means to be jealous, to be against other rivals. Well, let me ask you a question. If there is a rival for my spouse, should I just let that go? If somebody is pursuing my wife, am I just going to say, oh, well, hey, good luck? 
Would that be very loving from me as a husband? No. It's, you better have your bulletproof vest on. I, I will die for her. If you're not willing to die for her, that's where this is going. Okay? I'm willing to die for her. So, so, so this is the idea. The reason God is jealous for rivals in our life is the same reason that I would be jealous if my wife, if I had a rival. Why? Because I love her. And the reason God is jealous for rivals in our life is because he loves us. He wants what's best for us. He cares for us. He wants us for himself. I would say to the rival of, of mine, she's mine, not yours. God says the same thing. When we choose the world over choosing him, he's jealous because he wants to say, you're mine, not the world's. You're mine. I died for you. I gave my life for you. I gave my son for you. That's how much I love you. So that's this idea of jealousy. Now, this is not the only place that God talks about this. We're going to go to the Old Testament here, and this is going to be quite harsh. I'm just going to be honest with you. I thought about just paraphrasing this, but I thought, hey, you know what's the Bible? We're going with it. And teenagers are going to be like, what? He said that? But in the Old Testament, God told the prophet Hosea to marry a wife who was unfaithful. And he does that to teach the nation of Israel a lesson. I want you to see this. Hosea chapter 1 verse 2. When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go take to yourself a wife of whoredom and have children of whoredom, for the land commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. Teenagers, y'all read your Bible more. But, but he, he wants the prophet Hosea to marry an unfaithful wife to show how the nation of Israel has been unfaithful to God. Go to chapter 3, verse 1. And the Lord said to me, Go again, love a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress, even as the Lord loves the children of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love cakes of raisins. He said, Jose, I want you to love this woman who loves other men. She's not faithful to you. She's not loyal to you. She has a divided loyalty. But I want you to love her because this is a picture of what God does for us. That even though we're not loyal to Him, He loves us. He's jealous for us. He cares for us. And the truth of the matter is, when we go back to James chapter 4, and we think about this idea of, of sometimes we get friendly with the world. We want to please the world. We want to impress the world. That we have this divided loyalty of God. That even though we're unfaithful at times, God is faithful. God is faithful. And we're going to see that not only in Hosea. We're going to see it in James. We're going to see how much God loves us despite our lack of loyalty sometimes to him. See, this is a great picture of the grace of God. We, we, we hear this as Christians, we hear this question all the time. We hear this question of why would a loving God send people to hell? Why would he allow people to go to hell? Why, why, would, why would God only make one way to him? Why is there only one way through Jesus Christ? And if the truth of the matter is, is really examined, and we look at how we live our life, and we look at how unfaithful we are, it's amazing that God even made a way at all. But he did, because he loved us. And the way he did it is it's, we, we acquire it through faith, not through any goodness of our own, but through faith in Jesus Christ. Now let's go to the end of the book of Hosea, verse t, or chapter 10. <clears throat> this is one of my favorite passages in all the Bible. Because I think it's so practical. And, and I think about this passage a lot when I think about people who are caught in continual sin, people who are uh, struggling and, and just can't get out of a rut. I think this, this passage applies to us. We, we think about this idea of loving the world. The truth of the matter is we probably all do that at times. I do it myself too. I fall into that trap. And we have to say, how do I, how do I break away from the world and begin to follow God, and Hosea 10 tells us this. Verse 12, he says, Sow for yourself righteousness, 
Reap steadfast love. Break up your fallow ground, for it is the time to seek the Lord, that the Lord may come and rain righteousness upon you. You have plowed iniquity. You have reaped injustice. You have eaten the fruit of lies because you have trusted in your own way and in the multitude of your warriors. Now you look at this passage and you say, okay, what are you getting out of that? Here's what Hosea is telling us. He says sometimes that we harvest unrighteousness. We go back to James chapter 3. He even talks about that. We use the word harvest in James chapter 3. That sometimes we plow the same field over and over. And when we plow the same field over and over and we plant the same crops and we treat it the same way, guess what we're going to get? We're going to get the same thing every time. Are we not? But look at what he says in verse 12. First of all, fallow ground is unbroken land. It's ground that has not been broken by a plow. It, it, may, be, uh, it may have weeds on it. It may be unkept. Whatever. This is what he says. Verse 12. Sow for yourself righteousness. Reap steadfast love. Break up your fallow ground. Here's what he's saying. Hey, how about instead of plowing a garden over here where you've been plowing it for 20 years and getting the same thing you always got? How about we plow something new over here? How about we leave that garden alone that you've been working on that's gotten you the same harvest that you've always had and let's try something new. Let's plant something new. Let's break up this ground that hasn't been broken up and let's plant something different. Let's do things differently than we've always done and see if we don't get something different than we've always got. I think this is very common sense. It's time to, to tear some things up. It's time to break up some part of our lives that, that we've not broken up before. You think about uh, when we talked about the harvest in James chapter 3, we talked about this idea that a harvest takes time, does it not? When we plant a seed, it doesn't grow immediately. You know, I was thinking about this this week. When I was in school growing up, I don't remember if it was middle school, it probably was, we had to do a science experiment. And my experiment, you have to tell the teacher what it is, is, uh, is I was going to grow these seeds. My dad was in the farming business. Uh, he managed a farmer's co-op. So I was like, you know, we'll do something. We'll plant some seeds, and it'll grow. Well, listen, I forgot. And, I mean, there's like two days left, and i got to get something to grow. And, you know, you can't just make something grow overnight. Like, I'm leaving these things on in the light overnight thinking that's going to help. I did have a little sprout come up. My teacher knew that I started like two days ago. And it really didn't prove my point that some would grow faster than others. I don't even remember what the thing was. But, but, you know, this idea that we want something to grow fast doesn't happen. So listen, if you're here today and you're saying, listen, this idea of breaking up my fallow ground and I'm going to plant something different, I want, I want you to understand your harvest that you're going to see that when you break up your fallow ground, you begin to do things different, you're not immediately going to see this great change in your life. But the idea of a harvest is if you keep doing it over here in this garden, you keep planting, doing things the right way, that over time, when the harvest comes, you'll see the, the right thing to do. You'll, you'll see the benefits of why you began to plow in a different place. It takes time. It's not going to happen overnight. You will see some, some benefits overnight. So, so you ask the question, God, I want to change my life. Well, how do you do it? Quit plowing over here and plow somewhere else. So what does that look like? What does that look like to plow somewhere else? Well, maybe you should join a small group. If you've never been in a small group, you're worried, you're not following Christ, you're not doing a great job, you try to do a, a quiet time, but you just can't do it, join a small group. Maybe it's a couple's group. Maybe your marriage is not doing great. You know what I encourage you to do? Join up with other couples. Get in a group with other couples. Go hang out with other couples who are thriving. We're going to have a marriage conference here coming up. We're trying to finalize the date. We'll probably have an announcement on that next week. We'll have a marriage conference. Do something different than you've been doing. Join a small group. Serve in a ministry. Go to a marriage retreat. Uh, develop spiritual disciplines. You know what spiritual disciplines are? Spiritual disciplines are things like prayer. Be consistent in prayer. Bible study. Memorizing scripture, hiding God's word in your heart, uh, prayer, fasting, 
Um, we've got like 10 of these. I can't even remember what they all are, but Martin's doing videos on them. They're on our YouTube page where you can learn these spiritual disciplines. And you begin to do those. And you begin to plow this field over here week in, week out with these spiritual disciplines. And all of a sudden, you're in a small group. And all of a sudden, you can turn off the TV and quit watching those things you've been watching that are not always great. Maybe change the music you listen to. When you begin to do all these things and plow in a different field, guess what happens over time? God will begin to change your life. He'll begin to change you from the inside out. It happens over time. You can serve in a ministry. So what we need to do is quit plowing where we've been plowing. I'm going to ask TC and Danielle to come up here. I want to finish uh, with this one passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. I think it is timely to, to this idea as well. I do want to go back to James chapter 4 first. Verse 6, for those of us who have at times chased after the world, we looked at Hosea's faithfulness or God's faithfulness through Hosea the prophet. Look at what James says in James chapter 4 verse 6. After he talks about the adulterous generation, but he gives more grace. Therefore it said God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. For those of us who at times have plowed over here in this wrong field and we've reaped the wrong things as Christians, guess what? God is graceful. He's merciful. He's waiting for you to come back just like the prodigal son. The father was waiting for him to come back. This is the great grace that God has for us. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 says this. It's talking about how we're the temple of God. God's spirit is inside of us. He says, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What's he talking about there? Is we shouldn't be married to unbelievers. We shouldn't marry unbelievers. If you're already married to an unbeliever, it doesn't say that you're supposed to, hey, we're out, we're done. That's not what the Bible says. But you shouldn't marry an unbeliever. We shouldn't be unequally yoked. We shouldn't join ourselves with the things of the world. Why is that? Because when it comes to parenting, when it comes to raising children, when it comes to making decisions about life, you've got somebody who wants to follow God married to somebody who does not. And it's not always going to work. Does that mean it can't work? No. If you're married to an unbeliever, it certainly can work. But we shouldn't go out and choose that, right? Young people, teenagers, it's important, all right? Then it says, what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make, you, make my dwelling among them and walk among them. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. See, God has put his spirit inside of us. And when we come over here and we plow in this field that's in the world, we've basically taken God and we've put him in a, this position of being in the world. We, we, we're putting God in places God doesn't necessarily need to be. He's holy. And God sees us in us. What God wants us to do is he wants us to plow the right field. He wants us to take care of his temple. He wants us to put ourselves in positions where he can work in our life. And I think that's important. Maybe you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ. You don't have the Spirit of God in you. you. You've never put your faith and trust in Him. You're all in with the world. I got news for you. The world will never satisfy you. It'll never give you the things that you want. Only God can do that. Why? Because He's created us with a purpose. And that purpose is to serve Him. And we do that in joy because it's the greatest thing we could ever do. I'd encourage you to put your trust in Him, to choose Him today. Why? Because He's loving and gracious, and He's faithful, and He's waiting. Let's pray. God, we come to you today, God, and we see these passages about being unfaithful. And God, as Christians, I pray that we take this passage more serious than we probably have in the past, that we understand that our, our unfaithfulness and what it does to you and, and how jealous you are for us because you love us and you care for us. And God, I pray that uh, as Christians, we no longer plow where we've been plowing. 
plow in the world and plant worldly things and hope worldly things come out of it because that's what we want. But God, I pray that we break up our fallow ground and begin to cultivate a harvest in other places. We begin to do things that you've called us to do, develop spiritual disciplines, to join small groups. And then we'll begin to see you change our life. Until we plow in a different field, God, we're going to get the same thing we've always gotten. The reason so many addicts fall back into addiction is because they go back and they plow in the same field they've always plowed in. And God, help us to plow in a different field. Help us to to put our mark with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and worship. Thank you for listening to this message today brought to you by Refuge Church. Please visit our website for more resources as well as our YouTube channel. Just search for Refuge Church in Lenore City, Tennessee to find us. We hope that this message has helped you find hope in Jesus Christ.